Oh, wait, are you going to learn that on the title? The ideas of love in the feudalistic societies of Arthurian literature. Satisfaction and submission. The spiritual love in Shakespeare's Sonnet 116. Sir Gowan of the Green Knight and the Pentangle. Chaucer's proto-Protestant religious satire in the Canterbury Tales. Females as villains in Beowulf, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, and Londol. Depression represented in The Wanderer and the Seafarer, Monsters and Beowulf, The Weird Hero, I like that, <laughs> The Weird Hero Beowulf, The Impossible Chivalric Code, Women in Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, and Lonval. A Comparison of Codes, Lonval versus Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. The Weird Knight, that is probably the best <clears throat> I had a student one year in one class. I don't think it was this course. No, it was, of course, a, an honors course I did on Anglo-Saxon. Gayo Wolf, G-A-Y hyphen O-W-U-L-F, colon, the untold story. <laughs> How did he do? He got enough. Was that it? It was horrible. It was yeah, it was really, really bad. <coughs> Would have been one thing if it were, you know, I'm so happy. relatively decent, but it was just really, really bad. How did you get the name Beowulf wrong? Yes. He didn't he get it wrong. Lives. No, he was saying Beowulf was gay and went on the big old tangent and everything. Okay, we did Dunge the Flea. We're only, I don't know, like 10 days behind. Um, Dunge the Flea, last time we met, um, I probably will tr go ahead and try and just cover most of the stuff on done. I was looking back on my YouTube channel, and I might send you a link um, for stuff that we're not able to finish if we don't finish it by Tuesday. Yeah, um, to uh, just watch. This so um, I do want to do a valediction forbidding weeping on page 922. And I always forget. <clears throat> What's a valediction? A confirmation. No. How many of you, when you graduated high school, your high school, more than likely, if it was one of one or two in Murfreesboro, had. <coughs> Anywhere from 10 to 30 valedictorians. Yeah. Okay. You graduated with the highest honor, right? It's a person who graduates with, yeah, but what does a valedictorian do? Give a speech. So it's, the they're supposed to give a speech. The valedictorian is supposed to give the valedictory address. What's the valer, valedictory address? It's a farewell saying. Okay. The dictory means saying, valet, goodbye. Okay? Oh. So it's, that's what it is. So this is a valediction forbidding morning. Dunn wrote three valedictions, and I can never remember the third. A valediction forbidding morning, a valediction forbidding weeping, and a valediction of my name in a window, where he wrote his name in a glass window. Okay. So this is a valediction that is forbidding mourning. We didn't talk about this, right? We didn't do this. I'm getting my classes all confused. According to Isaac Walton, Dunn's first biographer, and someone who knew Dunn, um, also wrote a book called, you know, about fishing, um, oddly enough. I talked about Walton the, um, the other day when I said, you know, there were the two Dunns, the Jack Dunn, the Rake of London, the Dean Dunn, Dr. Dunn, Dean of St. Paul's, etc. According to Walton, Dunn wrote this poem shortly before he made a trip to the continent with Sir Robert Drury, his employer. Okay? And he wrote the poem because his wife, Anne, was pregnant at the time and had a premonition that something bad was going to happen. Turned out she did. She delivered a stillborn child. One of the 12 pregnancies um, that she had, I think four of them were either stillborn or four or five of them were stillborn or died in infancy. So this is a valediction forbidding mourning. 
And in this poem, Dunn gives us one of his famous um, metaphysical conceits, you know, that yoking together two wildly dissimilar things. In the flea, what was he yoking together? Love with a flea, sex with a flea, marriage bed with a flea, pretty much all kinds of stuff, fleas. You would think they had a big flea problem in Dunn's day, but not necessarily. As virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to their souls to go, while some of their sad friends do say, the breath goes now, and some say, no, so let us melt and make no noise, no tear floods nor sigh tempest move, to a profanation of our joys to tell the laity our loof. So he starts giving us a variety of ideas. Contra to Dylan Thomas's Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night, Dunn says virtuous men die how? What does he mean by mildly? Softly. Softly. Silently. You're there. You're at their bed. Is he still alive? I don't know. Check his pulse. Okay? They pass so mildly that the people around the deathbed are wondering, is the person still alive or not? And whisper to their souls to go, while some of their sad friends do say, the breath goes now, and some say, no, he's still alive. So let us melt. Who's the us? The speaker and the person being addressed. Okay. Notwithstanding what I said about Isaac Walton, don't assume the speaker is done. Always assume, with any poet, poetry, that the speaker is somebody created by the poet. Okay. So let us melt. That is, separate. No noise, make no noise, no tear floods, Petrarchan image, okay, from Petrarch, writer of sonnets in uh, Italy, nor Psy Tempest move, Psy Tempest, they're sighing because of their love for one another, creating storms and tempests, to a profanation of our joys to tell the laity our love. Two words there, profanation and laity. Religious terms. Profanation comes from the verb to profane. What's it mean? If somebody uses profanity, they're using what? Curse words. Curse language, curse words. Okay? So something profane is something that is not devout. It's not religious. Okay? So it would be a profanation of our joys. It would sully, it would dirty, it would make profane our joys. To do what? To tell the laity of our love. Who are the laity? Okay, kind of. It's a specific religious term. If this were a church... It's the people that go to church but have not been... They're not sisters and brothers and priests. They're not the people who have been initiated into the higher orders. For example, um, Catholic Church or an Orthodox Church or the Anglican Church, like Dunn was when Dunn became a priest. They haven't taken holy orders. They haven't been ordained to the ministry. Baptist Church, you're ordained to be a preacher. Okay. So laying on of hands, certain prayers, all that kind of stuff. The laity, if this were a church and I were the preacher, you guys would all be the laity. That is, you're the uninitiated out there that I spend my work, you know, informing you. Okay? So he says, it would be a profanation of our joys to tell the laity of our love. Notice, their love is the religious knowledge. Okay? It would profane our joys to tell those people out there about our love. Their love is kind of the secret, hidden knowledge. Moving of the earth. So it brings in a different image now. Moving of the earth brings harms and fears. Men reckon what it did and meant. But trepidation of the spheres, though greater far, is innocent. Trepidation of the spheres, we've talked about the spheres before. That's the Ptolemaic conception of the universe, where you have the Earth at the center, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine spheres surrounding it. 
or it's also called the geocentric okay, conception of the world, of the universe. Moving of the earth brings harms and fears. Your gloss tells you moving of the earth. Earthquakes, right? Whenever, and there's one every year, whenever there is a major earthquake somewhere around the world, you'll always have somebody say, ooh, what did it mean? Why did it happen? Where is God when these things occur? Okay? They reckon what it did and meant. Well, in Doug's day, they didn't know anything about tectonic plates. They, I mean, they had all kinds of wild ideas. You know, it's the earth passing gas. Literally, that was an idea. The earth just went, you know. Okay? It brings harms and fears. They wonder, what does it mean? Why? Biblically, you know, you have all kinds of quote-unquote prophecies that at the end times there will be earthquakes and wars and etc. But trepidation of the spheres, trepidation, the movement of the spheres, though greater far, is innocent. Right? The movement of these spheres is a lot greater than a little earthquake down here on Earth. Why is it innocent, though? Because well, it's ignorant or pure? No. Harmless. Harmless is what that means. How's it harmless? Notice the date. Your book gives you 1633. And, oh, there is no gloss giving you the date. The poem supposedly was written in 1611, just before Dunn went on this journey. In 1610, a famous Italian published a little book. Okay? The Italian has... Almost the first, almost the same first and last name. I think it's that spelled. Galileo Galilei. Okay? And what did Galileo publish? He published his findings proving that three earlier astronomers, Kepler, Copernicus, and a guy named Tycho Brahe, were all correct. They were correct in saying, wrong. The Earth isn't at the center of the universe. The Earth isn't even at the center of the solar system. The Earth revolves around the Sun, and the Sun itself even moves. Okay? In other words, okay, let's play for a moment that, that we do still have these even if they do move, doesn't mean anything. Because this idea is the source of what that we still have today. You can still pick up the Daily News Journal and read this in the Daily News Journal or the Tennessean or Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, New York Times. Horoscope. It's this that determines which of the zodiac signs you were born under. Okay? And if you're born under them, then that means those planetary and star influ have influence on your life. Okay? Dunn is saying, though these movements are greater, they are totally innocent on life down here. Dull, sublunary lovers love. Okay? So another image. But he's still playing upon the idea of the sphere. So here's the earth. Here's the moon. Moon circles around the earth. And what? Dull sublunary lovers love, whose soul is sense, cannot admit absence, because it doth remove those things which elemented it. In that idea of the movement of the spheres, Everything between the moon and the earth is mutable, impermanent, changing. Pull out whatever synonym you want. Okay? So, notice, dull, sublunary lovers love. That is, people whose love is determined by 
this sphere. Okay? He says, one, they're dull. They're not very sharp. Okay? Their love, what? Whose soul is sense. That is, the essence. The primary thing of their soul is sensory perception. Honey, why do you love me? It's because of that great body of yours. Honey, why do you love me? Oh, it's a beautiful voice. Why do you love me? Oh, it's your eyes. Why do you love me? It's that smell you have. Why do you love me? It's, it's something sensory. Okay? That is the essence of the love of dull sublunary lovers. Dull sublunary lovers love whose soul is sense cannot admit absence. Well, why not? Because if my lover was sitting right here, and I could see her, and then she walked out that door and went away so that I couldn't see her through the window, I couldn't see her anymore. And because my love is based upon sensory perception, and she's now beyond my sensory perception, then what? Old Stephen or Elvin Bishop, I can't remember which song from the 1970s. If you can't love the one you love, love the one you're with. Why? Because, come here. <laughs> because you can be with anyone. And if your love is made up of sensory perception, it doesn't really matter whether the one you love is pretty or ugly, or it's just as long as they're there, okay? Because their soul, because their lover's love, whose soul is sense cannot emit absence. Why? Because it doth remove those things which elemented it. The atoms of their love is mere sensory perception. But we, who are the we? We're the secret initiates in our love. Those dull sublunary lovers, they're the laity. Okay? But we, by a love so much refined. So what do you do when you refine something? You purify it. So our love, notice, is refined. But we, by a love so much refined that ourselves know not what it is. Why do you love me? I just do. Okay? We enter assured of the mind. It's kind of like, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. I think Dunn probably had that poem partially, at least in his mind when he wrote this. Enter assured of the mind, care less, eyes, lips, and hands too. If you step out the room and I love you, doesn't matter. Why? Because you're still up here. Okay? Our two souls, therefore, which are one, how are they one? Because they're interassured of the mind. How else are they one? Possibly because of the wedding vows in the Anglican ceremony, and the two shall be one. Okay? Which are one, though I must go, endure not yet a breach, but an expansion, like gold to airy thinness beat. So, our souls are one. I've got to go. <laughs> no. Instead, it's like gold. Gold is what kind of metal? Malleable. It's malleable. Which means you can pound it. You can shape it. You can mold it. Very, very thin. Theoretically, you could pound gold thin enough to use to replace this and see through it. It'd be kind of gold tinted, be a hell of a lot better than that. Okay? But it's like rubber, it expands, or it could expand, or at least that's his image. I think kind of something between that stands and the next stand, and she's kind of going like, come on. Think of a better image. Come on, give me another metaphysical conceit, John. Okay, so if they two, they are like, as stiff twin compasses are two. He means the two legs of a compass, this kind of compass, a drawing compass, not one that tells you northeast, west, south. 
is I saw the fixed foot. So let's say her soul is this one. It's the one with the point. Okay? Does what? Makes no show to move, but doth if the other do. Right? He doesn't mean doth if the other do. If I move this leg up like this. Means doth if the other do, and you're keeping this lead down on the paper. Well, what happens to this leg? It does what? It leans and hearkens after it. No matter how far away this one leans, and I could do this with four inch compass, I could do it with a 12 inch compass. And no matter what, the farther this one goes away, the more this one does what? And though it in the center set, this foot, it leans and hearkens after it. So maybe I'm just going to France, baby. Okay, maybe I'm going to Germany, Poland. Lithuania, Russia, the farther and farther and farther, the more and more and more, your soul, the fixed foot, does what? Leans and hearkens. Hearkens means calls for. And grows erect as what? As this one comes back home. What's the metaphysical conceit? Our souls are like a compass. Two dissimilar things, right? Who in the world, in their right mind, would think of a geometer's compass to compare to two lovers' souls? Well, Dunn likes that image. He uses it a lot. Dunn likes images of geometry and map making. He uses cartography images all the time. Math is the true language of love. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not in my book, but okay. <laughs> Such wilt thou be to me who must like the other foot obliquely. What does that mean, obliquely? It's at an angle. In other words, I've got to leave. I have to become at an angle to you. I can't remain upright with you. And yeah, there is, because it's done, there is possibly some dirty punning going on there. Okay, Thy firmness makes my circle just, and makes me in where I begun. That is, if you don't stay here, because according to Walton in that biography, she wanted to go with him. She didn't want him to stay. She wanted to go. If you don't stay here, he says, what kind of circle will I make? Well, what happens if you have two legs of a compass like this, and you don't keep this one fixed? You do this. And then that does what? It doesn't come back home. So if you don't stay here, the speaker is saying, what might my soul do? Wander. Now that's pretty cool if you think about it. I mean, that's wit that Dunn is showing there. Look at the next poem. The ecstasy. I don't know if it's the next one. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> what is an ecstasy? Mm -hmm. Not a date rape drug. It's uh, the height of uh, what's called ero erotic arousal or something like that? No, not necessarily. That was an out-of-body type experience. It's an out-of-body experience. It's an experience, according to the Greeks, where... The soul leaves the body, and the body stays alive. But the soul, you know, read some Shirley MacLaine. She's, you know, astral experiences and projecting your body, etc. So we get this image. Where? Like a pillow on a bed, a pregnant bank swelled up to rest the violet's reclining head. Sat we two, one another's best. So, two people sitting how? There's an image like a pillow on a bed, a pregnant bank swelled up. What kind of bank? Like a bank by a creek. But it's like a pregnant bank. Like it's getting ready to burst forth. Okay? They sat, how? One another's best. So they sit with one kind of reclining against the other, and they're both kind of reclining 
against this bank. And notice what the speaker says. We are one another's best. It's kind of like the old Latin sumum bonum, the highest good. Socrates said, seek the highest good, which Socrates defined as God. Not Christian God, just God. Aristotle replaced the word God, prime mover. Okay, So seek that. We are one another's best. Kind of implying they each find their completion in the other. So, our hands were firmly cemented with a fast balm, which thence did spring. They're holding hands. What's the fast balm which sprung from their hands holding together? What happens if you hold somebody's hand for too long? It's, it's, you get sweaty. Sweaty palms. And that sweat acts like what? Here, cement. It's super glue. <laughs> Try that on your boyfriend, girlfriend. You know, put some super glue on your hand and just go hold it for a good 10 seconds and ha, can't let go. <clears throat> so their hands are cemented. Our eye beams, we've talked about this image before, twisted. Why? Because they're twisted people? No. What are they doing? Looking deeply into each other's eyes. And their eye beams, because the medieval renaissance idea was that the way we see is because our eyes shoot out beams of light, which doesn't make any sense, because you would think that people would be able to go in the dark, and then you'd see like lasers all over the place. <laughs> but we don't, right? They're not visible beams of light. They're invisible beams of light. Yeah, right. But their eyes are doing what? It's eye sex. Okay? They are reproducing kind of in their eyes. And did thread our eyes upon one double string. So to engraft our hands as yet was all our means to make us one. Notice, one hand, another hand, together, it's, it's one, it's not. So this is the only way they've made themselves one. They've not had sex. And pictures in our eyes to get was all our propagation. So why we know, you know, they're not holding hands this far apart, like, you know, they each have body odor or something. They are really close to each other, looking in each other's eyes. And what does he see in her eyes? Himself. And what does she see in his eyes? Herself. She begets herself in his eyes. He begets himself in her eyes. All right? As twixt two equal armies... Fate suspends uncertain victory. Well, that's not a nice image. I mean, it's martial imagery. It's pretending violence. Our souls, which to advance their state were gone out, hung twixt her and me. This is the ecstasy. His soul leaves his body. Her soul leaves her body. So the bodies are down there holding hands, looking at each other, madly in love. And the souls come out, and they are like two armies. What do armies usually do? Battle each other. What, yeah, armies are there to fight. They're not there to make love. Because that would be weird. <laughs> love in the battlefield, right? It'd be especially <laughs> weird on the battlefield. <laughs> so, they hung twixt her and me, and whilst our souls negotiate there. Kind of interesting language. You know, 300, 400 years before the idea of a prenup, prenuptial agreement. So they're negotiating. What are they negotiating? What would two armies negotiate? Surrender. Hmm. Who's going to surrender to whom? We, like sepulchral, I hate that word, sepulchral statues lay. How do sepulchral statues lay? 
Except for in the Doctor Who series with the <laughs> Weeping Ages. No. Still? Well, I mean, maybe. Still. Oh. They're sepulchral. There are statues on sepulchers. Tombs. They're statues. They don't move. So that's how they are. All day, the same our postures were. I mean, these two have it really bad for each other. <laughs> and we said nothing all the day. They're just looking in each other's eyes. If any, so by love refined, that he soul's language understood. Notice, if you are refined, if you are purified by love, you might be able to understand the language of the soul. So, if you were purified by such love, and you understood soul's language, and by good love were grown all mind, that is, kind of left the body behind, became all mind, with inconvenient distance stood. That is, Trevor and his girlfriend are over there, and I'm standing here. I'm purified by love, but I've got a big ear, because <laughs> I'm over to hearing, I'm listening. He, though he knew not which soul spake, because both men both spake the same, might thence a new concoction take and part far purer than he came. He knew not which soul, which soul spake, why? Because they both spake the same, they both meant the same. Each soul is saying and meaning the exact same thing. He might leave from there with what? A new concoction. And your gloss tells you he might be even further purified. Why? Well, it's a good old Hegelian dialectic. A, B, but here they both speak and mean the same. See, in the Hegelian dialectic, you have thesis, antithesis. They go to war and produce what? Synthesis. C, only thing is, there is such a thesis and antithesis. It's thesis, thesis. It's the exact same thesis. So it's not synthesis anymore. Here, it's the pure concoction. Why? Because it's the equal mixing of this and the equal mixing of this to produce something even purer. And he might part purer than he became. This is what he hears. This ecstasy doth unperplex, we said, and tell us what we love. It unperplexes. Go back to valediction forbidding morning. We, by a love so much refined that ourselves know not what it is. Why do you love me? I don't know. The dull sublunary lovers, why do you love me? Because how you look. Because how you sound. Because all those things. But we, we're told, this ecstasy doth unperplex and tell us what we love. Why unperplex? What does it mean to be perplexed? Confused. Confused. Not clear. So the ecstasy, the souls leaving the bodies, makes what? Everything perfectly clear. What's the problem, therefore? The problem lies in the body. Hmm. We see by this. What's the by this? This ecstasy. We see by this, by this ecstasy, it was not sex. By the souls getting out of the body, they're no longer troubled with sex. It's not sex. Why? Because the souls out of the body love each other. That has nothing to do with sex. Hmm. We see, we saw not what did move. I love Dunn's use of tense here. We see now, during the ecstasy, that before, when our souls were in our bodies, we saw not what did move. It's kind of like, now, up here, 
we see that when we are in our bodies, what did we think moved? Body, body. She thought, you know, one of the Chris's, and he thought swimsuit model. It was the flesh that moved, maybe literally. But as all several souls contain mixture of things, they know not what. Love, these mixed souls, doth mix again, and makes both one each this and that. What? As all several souls contain mixture of things. Souls are made up of elements. What are the elements? Well, you could go back, you know, ancient Greeks, earth, air, fire, water. Okay. And they're mixed how? Notice the mixture of things, they don't know what the things are. Love, these mixed souls, doth mix again. That is, love, capital L, takes this soul, which is made up of certain elements, and this soul, and does what? Puts them in a blender, puts it on high, and mixes them again. And makes both one, each this and that. That is, makes this one this, and this one this, and both together one. How so? Speaker doesn't answer. Speaker says, okay, let me give you another image. A single violet transplant, the strength, the color, and the size, all which before was poor and scant, redoubles still and multiplies. Right? If you, maybe you don't like violets. Maybe you want to use daylilies. Take a big old clump of daylilies, cut it in two, take part, not two equal parts, cut it in two where you leave 90% and you take 10%, take that 10%, plant it in the ground, and what eventually will that 10% do? It'll grow and get as large as the other one. So... When love with one another so interanimates two souls. So love possibly being out here or love being an element of the soul. When love with one another so interanimates. Notice it's not interanimates and it's not just animates. It's inter in. Inter means what? Like Interstate commerce between. In means inside. Animates means gives life to. Okay? So when love inter-in animates two souls between the two souls, it's like it takes life from one and gives to another and from that to the other and within that abler soul, which thence doth flow, defects of loneliness controls. How does it control defect of loneliness? Because when you had just the one, the one was not complete. How many of you have seen Jerry Maguire? Stupid line at the end of the film. When what's your name says what to Jerry? You, after that, uh, complete me. <laughs> you had me at you. Know. No, it's the idea of this is what. It's incomplete. Okay? The, the ancient Greek notion of why things died is because we do not have our elements mixed equally. None of us. That's why we all die. Some of us are a little more earthy. Some are a little more airy. You know, airhead. Some of us are a little more fiery, etc. Okay? If we could create a person perfectly mixed, that person would never die. Ancient Greek idea. So, that abler soul which thinks death flow defects of loneliness controls. We then, who are this new soul, this 
because it's made up of A and B. Who are this new soul? Lost my place. Know of what we are composed and made. For the atomies of which we grow are souls who no change can invade. How do they know? Because I'm made of you and you are made of me. And all together we are made of each other. So is he suggesting uh, immortality? Yeah, kind of, at this point. Okay, but bear in mind, the souls are where? Up here, where are the bodies? Down here, clasping the hands, looking at each other. Okay? What is a soul without a body? If the body's been alive, a ghost, <laughs> what's a body without a soul? Meat, <laughs> carcass. <laughs> so, for the atomies of which we grow are souls, that is, the elements of which we grow are souls, whom no change can invade. Why? Souls are immortal. Souls don't die. But, oh, alas, so long, so far, our bodies, why do we bear? Why do we forbear? Who says that? Both souls. Both spake, both meant the same. Because who does that really sound like? That sounds like the guy, right? I mean, come on, baby. If you really love me, you'd... Our bodies, why do we forbear? They're ours, though they're not we. We are the intelligences. There's that Ptolemaic image again. They, the sphere. We, we the soul, control the body. Or should is the idea, okay? Notice, the bodies are ours, though they're not the we, right? What, what happens, again, when a soul leaves a body, you end up with something, but it's not the person, which is why in Hamlet, Act 5, Scene 1, you have the grave digger scene, and Hamlet comes and asks, well, whose grave are you digging? He says, no one's. Well, what do you mean, no one's? It has to be someone's. He goes, well, the one that was alive. Well, who was that? No one. Why? Because the person who was alive is no longer there. Well, it, it was a she, he goes on. Okay? The grave digger girls. So, we owe them thanks. That is, we owe our bodies thanks. Why? Because they thus did us to us at first convey. Who are the us? The souls. Can you come to know somebody? Okay. Shouldn't ask this question because of the Damn it, you see these things. Can you come to know somebody without being physically near them? Don't mean to, but yeah, I do. People on these are not your friends. Social media should be called anti-social media. I mean, just big study just announced the other day. Social media, media number one cause of depression in millennials today. Number one cause. And it's an actual causal study. It's not a correlation. But people who use social media are depressed. It's social media causes depression. Why? I don't have as many likes as so-and-so has. I don't have as many friends. as They're not your friends. They're electronic friends. They're make-believe friends. How do you come to develop friends? Contact. Okay? So the speaker says, they did us to us at first convey, yielded their forces. What are the forces of the bodies? So, no, just the opposite. Senses. Because the body's made of what? Stuff. You can feel it. You can cut, can you can touch it. Can you touch somebody's soul? Like, no. Connor's soul isn't hovering over here and I can go. He kind of, <laughs> you know, you, no, it doesn't happen that way. Even if you touch a person, you don't touch their soul. So the force of the body is sense. They yielded their forces, sense to us, nor are dross, but alley. Your glass tells you alloy. What is a metal alloy? It's a mixture of two metals. 
Okay? Why would you mix two metals? Why might you mix something like aluminum and titanium? Strength, not malleability, lightness. Lightness. You get the strength, but you don't have to have twice the amount of titanium. You have lightness, okay? So you mix something to make what? Something better out of it. Something purer. That's why he says, nor are they dross to us. Because what is dross? When you purify something, when you refine metal ore, gold ore. You know, you take gold out of the ground. You don't just take pure solid gold out of the ground. You dig big clumps of dirt and stuff. You wash it, maybe in old mining days, through water. But even then, you don't have pure gold. If you have nuggets, what well, still has to be done? You've got to purify it. You've got to melt it to do what? Get all the impurities out. This stuff, supposedly, 100% natural spring. Yeah, I don't believe that. It's supposedly pure. Okay? That means it doesn't have anything else in it but H2O. So, they're not dross. They're not the stuff purified, but alloy. Why does the speaker make this point? Because it's not pure alloy. It's homogenous. Okay. It's even baser, even more basic than that. Well, in one sense, more basic. In another sense, you'll never guess. <laughs> it's because of Christian doctrine. And one of the early, one of the early heresies of the church. Sex is evil. No, not <laughs> close. Kind of. The Manichaean heresy, from a guy named Manes, okay, who said the body is bad. Materiality is bad. The idea is to get away from the material stuff. You saw it in a great. Some people call it great. Others don't. A great film from the when? 1983. Long before most of you were a twinkle, probably even in your grandparents' eyes, maybe. Showed you how old I am. Um, Empire, no, not Empire Strikes Back. Return. Return of the Jedi. Where Yoda is speaking with Luke over on the whatever the planet is. They go by. <laughs> Thank you. And Luke's having a hard time moving stuff. And Yoda tells him, mm. I'm trying to think of his exact words. Celestial beings we are. Not this crude matter. What does he mean? This, this, not this, because this can be taken off. This crude matter. And so what do we see at the end of that film? That we see Yoda. It's <laughs> a what? That is Empire Strikes Back. It is Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, it is Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, it's it's is Empire Strikes Back. Where he's trying to look the spaceship. Yeah. yeah and so at the end of the third film, what do we see? We see Yoda. We see Obi-Wan. And we see Anakin Skywalker. How? Ghosts. Ghosts. Not ghosts. We see them in their true form. Celestial beings. This has got to be cast away. That's what the Manichaean heresy was. Why is it a heresy? Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God, and at the end of the first day, what? It's pretty good. Turn the page. Next day, it's pretty good. What's God doing throughout the first six days? Creating the world. Stuff. All of this stuff. Okay? So, on man, heaven's influence works not so, but that it first imprints the air. Well, how does heaven make its influence? Christians are getting ready to celebrate Christmas coming up. Well, what happened, apparently, nine months before that? You had the Annunciation. Gabriel comes to Mary. Is Mary just sitting there and she looks off because she hears a voice? Mary, you, blessed art thou, full of grace, you know. God's going to come. And she's going, like, what? <laughs> no, what happens? She sees. Wow. 
Gabriel is an incorporeal, incorporeal being. That is, he has no body. According to the speaker here, what must an angel therefore do? Imprint a form on air. It has to take a body. But then it first imprints the air. So, that is, just like that, soul into the soul may flow. Place, though it to body first repair. That is, my soul can flow into your soul, your soul can flow into my soul, the two will become one, but how? Only after the bodies do. Only after the bodies do. As our blood labors to beget spirits, as like souls as it can, that is, this is the body's way of trying to be godlike. Okay? I want to create a, the body says, I want to create something like a soul. Well, how can it do that? By coming together. As our, love, as our blood labors to beget spirits, as like souls as it can, because such fingers need to knit that subtle knot which makes us man. What is that subtle knot? A knot is obviously what? What do you do when you tie a knot? Two separate strings, right? Are joined together. For what purpose? To keep them together. So what's the subtle knot that makes us man? It's one of the most beautiful lines in English poetry, I think. It's the knotting together, the joining together of what? Body and soul. Right? Because it's pretty easy to untie the knot, right? The subtle knot that... Why is it a subtle knot, though? Subtle. Try to locate the soul in the body. It's not really noticeable. Cognitive scientists are starting to tell us, well, I really can find it. <laughs> Put little electrodes and oh, look, there's the soul. It's this one part of the brain. Is it? They think it is. So must pure lovers, souls descend to affections and to faculties, which sense may reach and apprehend. Notice, reach and what? Old at t commercial. Reach out and touch someone which may reach and apprehend, else a great prison, a great prince in prison lies. One of the dominant images in literature in the mid-20th century was the idea that everybody lives in isolation from everybody else. Read almost any of Tennessee Williams's plays, and you see a lot of wall imagery. Like we're each of us walking around in this big of space. And it's always around us. And we're living within these walls. And we can never really, and this is why the AT&T commercial you know, came up with that. So it's one of the reasons I think why. We can't really reach out and touch someone. We are imprisoned. That's why Jean-Paul Sartre wrote, no exit. We can't get outside our bodies. Some of the philosophers in the mid-20th century said, you can never really truly know another person. Well, that way lies madness, which is why a lot of people committed suicide when they, you know, developed that mentality. That's why the speaker says, since me reach and apprehend, else a great prince in prison lies. What's the great prince? The soul. Why is, it a, why is the body a prison? See, if the Manichees are right, then this is a prison. And the only way you get out is to die. Okay? This speaker says, nope, you can get out another way. How is it? To reach out and touch someone. In more ways than one. To our bodies turn we then. 
Why? That so weak men on love revealed may look. He's not saying, and let's do it in the window so people can see us. It's not what he means. He means so that weak people, people who don't have a refined love like we have, may do what? May see what real love is like. You've probably known people, maybe parents or friends or whatever, and said, that's real love. Just as you've probably known people who said, that's not what I want to be like. <laughs> okay. Love's mysteries and souls do grow, but yet the body is his book. And what do you do? What do you do with books? Read them. Read them. You read them. And if some lover such as we have heard this dialogue of one, why is it a dialogue of one? Okay, why else? Both spake, both meant the same. If they both speak the same, they both mean the exact same, then it is a dialogue of one, in which case it is a monologue. Let him still mark us. That is, and if somebody is overhearing this conversation we are having, which is meant to be private, eavesdropper, let him still mark us what? When he shall see small change when we're two bodies gone. That is, when our souls go from up here back down into our bodies and we go back into town, let him mark us. That is, let him follow around and spy on us and he'll see what? There's no change. They are exactly like they were there. Why? Because this is not dull, sublunary lover's love. Dunn kind of gives, in his romantic poetry, if you want, some call it chauvinistic poetry, Dunn kind of gives, he gives multiple varying experiences of love. Yeah, he gives the jilted lover's experience. He gives the man about town, you know, sleep with whomever, whenever, however he can, whatever, even, not necessarily who, uh, he can. But he also gives... In some of the poems, this perspective, which is kind of a mixing of divine and erotic. And Dunn loves to do that. He loves to use, in some of his poetry, the divine, uh, excuse me, he loves to use the erotic okay, as an indicator of the divine. Probably because of things like the Song of Solomon in the Old Testament which is read entirely by the church, allegorically. That this isn't really about some guy enjoying his beloved's body, even though the literal text is all about, you know, her breasts are like grapes. And man, do I like grapes. And it just goes on and on and on. I, I once heard one guy saying, you know, which is why in the early church people said you couldn't read that until you were 30 or so. You know? <laughs> this speaker is talking about what kind of love? Is it just down and dirty sex? <clears throat> no. It is Shakespeare's the marriage of true minds kind of love. Okay? Go from there to... Oh, we're going to do the Holy Sonnets. Oh, God, I'm totally fine. Um, I did my... My dissertation was on the Holy Sonnets. It really should. The only problem is you're given... Only four, you're only given eight, twelve of them. Um, they exist in three different orderings. So Dunn wrote twelve, and then he kind of revised, pulled four out, added four more, and then he wrote three more after that, and then he wrote three more after that. Um, so it's hard to really, or four more after that. Um, so, you know, I think I'm going to just skip them. Um, no. Flip a coin. Let's do, I think it's in here. Yeah, look at number 14.
once read an article about this sonnet called Dunn's Divine Rapist. Batter my heart, three-person God, for you as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand or throw me and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. Is that how that sonnet is supposed to be read? No. Batter my heart, three-person God. What does the batter mean? Like battering ram. Break it. Psalm 51. A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Batter my heart, three-person God. Why three-person? Trinitarian. Okay. For you as yet, but knock, breathe. All of these, by the way, are images from Scripture. Christ says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Hello, anybody here? If you let me in, I will come breathe. Image of Pentecost. Christ breathed on the apostles. Okay. Shine. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you as an Old Testament blessing. And seek to mend. That is, I'll fix what's broken. No, 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 no. Our speaker says, that I may rise and stand. Overthrow me means knock me to the ground. And bend your force. To do what? Break, blow, burn, and make me new. Break, blow, burn. Those are all images from threshing. Get a, wheat, get a kernel of wheat and you break it. You break the husk. You blow the chaff away. You burn that and you make me new. In other words, God, you're going to have to kind of start over. I... Like an usurped town to another do, labor to admit you, but no to no end. Who's the other that the speaker says I am due to? I'm like a usurped town. Okay, the town is usurped. That is, somebody's taking control of it. I'm due to somebody else who's God. Okay? I try to admit you, that is, I try to open the door, but to no end, to no purpose. I can't achieve that. Reason your viceroy in me. Reason is your vice regent, your representative in me, God. It should do what? It should defend me. But it's captive and proves weak or untrue. Weak, I'm kind of, you know, weak-minded, or it's unfaithful. Not, untrue doesn't mean reason is lying. It means reason is not telling the truth. Uh, excuse me. Reason is not faithful to you. Shut up. Keep calling me. So, dearly I love you and would be loved fain, that is in return, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Well, who's the three-person God's enemy? Satan. Satan. Which means what? The word literally just means what? Adversary. Adversary. So you get in a fight with somebody, you know, it's okay to call him the great Satan. There's your great adversary. That's all the word literally means. Your opponent. Okay? So, I betrothed unto your enemy. So here's what you got to do, God. Divorce me. Untie or break that knot again. What knot? That subtle knot that makes man... <laughs> Take me to you, imprison me, for I accept you enthrall me. What does it mean to enthrall? To be made a slave of. So, imprison me. Why? Because unless you imprison me, unless you make me your slave, I'll never be free. Nor will I ever be chaste, except you ravish me. I'll never be pure unless you rape me. That's essentially what this one article said Dunn was getting at. Two meanings of the word ravish. One does mean to sexually take without permission. Rape. What's another one? To remove from a situation. So, I will never be chased unless you do what? Remove me from what situation? Life. Life. Unless you remove me from... He doesn't mean chaste sexually. 
He means pure. St. Paul says throughout his epistles, what's the problem he has? The thing I want to do, I don't do. The thing I don't want to do, I do do. <laughs> In other words, he does a lot of do-do, and he shouldn't. He knows what he should do, but he doesn't. Speaker's saying essentially the same here, so that's why the speaker says, you got to stop me. I'll, I'll do it again if you don't, all right? Um, let's turn briefly to, oh, I didn't include it. Let's skip Good Friday 1613, writing westward for a moment, and go to Meditation 17, pages 940 and 941. The Meditations are from a book called Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions. Written in 1624, January of 1624, November, December of 1623, Dunn came down with an illness and thought he was dying. People were dying from the same illness. This is at the time when he was the Dean of St. Paul's, um, which means he ran the cathedral, as well as preached and everything. All right? And he thought he was dying, and he wrote these devotions, a series of them. It's like 23 or 24. And they all have this structure where um, you get a Latin phrase, you have a, another part, then there's a long prayer, and then there's an expostulation, kind of an explanation of what it all means. Okay? This is Meditation 17. Perchance, 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 he for whom this bell tolls may be so ill as that he knows not it tolls for him. Let me back up for a moment. English custom is that when somebody dies, or it was, I don't know that they still do this today. They did it in the early 20th century still. English custom was that when somebody dies, you rang the bell, church bell, parish bell, to indicate somebody has died. Okay? You rang it nine times if a man died, and eight times if a woman died. Not because nine is better than eight and men are more important than women. It's just to distinguish the sex of the person who died. So you ring it, let's say a woman dies and she's 23. You ring it eight times. It's not bing, 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 it's slow tolling. Eight times, and then there's a pause, and then it would ring the number of years the person lived. So I mean, if somebody lived 95 years, it'd be a long tolling of the bell. But one of the things was that indicated kind of shorthand way to people who died, because in a small parish, you would know the people that were ill, and if you hear the bell and you count the number of tolling, 23, oh, that's little Agnes, you know, kind of a thing. So, Dunn's hearing these bells ringing a lot. A lot of church bells in London, and there's like constant ringing. So, perchance he for whom this bell tolls may be so ill as that he knows not it tolls for him. That is, he's so close to death's door, he doesn't realize he's that close to death's door. And perchance, I may think myself so much better than I am, as that they who are about me and see my state may have caused it to toll for me, and I don't know that. That is, and I think I'm doing okay, but those who are sitting around me know, John's about to kick, start ringing the bell. <laughs> the church is Catholic. Universal. Universal means Catholic. Right? The church is Catholic, universal. So all her actions, that is, everything the church does affects everybody within the church. All that she does belongs to all. So it gives an example. When she baptizes a child, that action concerns me. Why? For that child is thereby connected to that body, which is my head too, and engrafted into that body whereof I am a member. And when she buries a man, that action concerns me. All mankind is of one author and is one volume. Now, this is where I really love this meditation. All mankind is of one author. Notice what Dunn has not just said. Keep in mind, he's an Anglican priest. He hasn't said, all mankind are only Anglicans are made by God. 
That is, only Anglicans are important. All mankind. It is of one volume. This is the book of humanity. Okay? All of your lives are in here, and everybody you love and everybody you hate, they're all in here. When one man dies, one chapter is not torn out of the book, but translated into a better language. Well, what better language than English? Some people would say Latin. Some would say Greek. In Dunn's day, some would say Hebrew. Why? Because that's the language God spoke. Because Jews speak Hebrew, and God obviously was a Jew. I mean, go back to Genesis. It's all there. It's not, by the way. <laughs> Take my history and English language course. We'll talk about that. So, when one man dies, one chapter is not torn out of the book, but translated into a better language. And every chapter must be so translated. Notice, every chapter. He doesn't say only some. He doesn't say only the tulips. Remember the Calvin stuff? Every chapter must be so translated. God employs several translators. Okay, translation is what? Yeah. Death. Right? How's that for a nice metaphor? What are some of God's translators? Age. Age. Sickness, war, justice. But God's hand is in every translation. That means the poor homeless guy who dies under the bridge. God's hand is in that translation. And his hand shall bind up all our scattered leaves again. For that library, this is the end it just knocks my socks off. For that library where every book will shall lie open to one another. So, here's my book. Here's Kyle's book. Here's Jamie's book. Here's JR's book. Here's All books shall what? Lie open. What does that mean? St. Paul's in Corinthians. We shall know as we are known. We shall see not as we do now, through a glass darkly, through lenses, but perfectly. So, as therefore the bell that rings to a sermon calls not upon the preacher only, again, English practice, you ring the church bell to indicate, you know, 15 minutes, better get a move on, 10 minutes, better get a move on, calls not only the preacher but the congregation, so this bell calls us all. So the bell has not just become just a bell announcing somebody's death. It now becomes a metaphor for others to pay attention to. But how much more me? Why? Because I'm sick and I've got a fever. This is done speaking. This is where you don't say, oh, it's just the persona. No, this is done. Thinking he is literally dying. And he says, maybe the bell is for me. There was a contention as far as the suit in which both piety and dignity, religion and estimation were mingled. Which of the religious orders should ring the prayers first in the morning? Tells you kind of the unimportant things that religious orders could debate about. Who should ring the bell first in the morning? And it was determined, duh, that those who rose the earliest should ring the bell first. So if we understand aright the dignity of this bell that tolls for our evening prayer, now he's telling us what the bell is literally ringing for. It's calling people to vespers to come to evening prayer. Huh. We would be glad to make it ours by rising early in that application. Then it might be ours as well as his. Oh, but maybe it's not for vespers. Maybe it is really for somebody who's dying. The bell doth toll for him that thinks it doth. The bell doth toll for him that thinks it doth. So if the bell is tolling to indicate somebody's death, and you think it is your bell, then what? Then it is for you. As a man thinketh, so is he, Christ says. What's he mean? Well, if you think the bell is for you, then what? 
You better, better be what? Ready to die. You better be ready. Hamlet says towards the end of the play in Act 5, after he's come back, he's getting ready to do the jousting contest with Laertes. He and his friend Horatio, they're talking about death. And Hamlet says, you know, if it's to be now, then it's not to be later. If it's to be later, it won't be now. That is death. If I'm supposed to die now, then I'm not supposed to die later. If I'm supposed to die later, then I won't die now. The readiness is all, Hamlet says. That is, that's the important thing. To be ready to die. So, done. The bell doth toll for him that thinks it doth. And though it intermit again, yet from that minute that that occasion wrought upon him, he is united to God. Though it intermit, it stop, and he not die, that's what he means when he says, when he first heard the bell toll, and he thinks it's for me, and then it stops, from that point on, he's united to God. How so? Who casts not up his eye to the sun when it rises? Who takes off his eye from a comet when that breaks out? Who bears not his ear to any bell which upon any occasion rings? And I need to do this sometime with clients. I need to prepare this. You know, it'd be like if one of your phones went off right now. Everybody's ear would be to that phone. Okay? That's what he means. But who can remove it from that bell which is passing a piece of himself out of this world? What does he mean, a piece of himself? It's so... No man is an island. Hugh, Simon, and Garfunkel, the sounds of silence. I am a rock. I am an island. Okay, it's because Paul Simon was so well read. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent. What's the continent? Collectively called humanity. A part of the main, if a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less. As well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or thine own were, any man's death diminishes me, because I am involved in mankind. If you've never read it before, read Charles Dickens as a Christmas Carol. Or you can see one of the good adaptations, or you can see one of the bad adaptations. Just not the Muppets one. Because <laughs> it's a bad adaptation. My, my wife, you know, I don't believe you can't like that. The scene where Scrooge talks with Marley. And Scrooge says, Marley, you were always such a good businessman. What does Marley say? Be my works. Because Scrooge goes on and talks about the surplus population. What is he hap what happens on his journeys? He sees the surplus population, need and want. Okay. Okay. I found this on the web for is the surplus population. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Almost as good as if I'd had the phone ring, you know. So Therefore, never sin to know for whom the bell tolls. Title, Hemingway, ask not for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Neither can we call this a begging of misery or a borrowing, a begging of misery or borrowing of misery. As though we were not miserable enough of ourselves, right? He's saying, you know, mankind's miserable. But first must, but must fetch in more from the next house. So what does he say is the purpose of this misery, of this tribulation? He says, imagine this is not a crappy iPhone, but this is a bar of gold. This is misery. This is pain. This is affliction in this life. All right? It's also a bar of gold. You're hungry. You've got a bar of gold. You want to get something to eat. You go to a restaurant. You pop that down on the table to the waiter. What's the waiter going to do? If he's smart, take it and run. 
<laughs> if he's not smart, he's going to say, I, I can't take that. Why not? It's too much. No. It's not, it's not our legal currency. It's not currency. It's not currency. What do you have to do to that bar of gold? You can't do it anymore because we don't have a gold standard. You have to turn it into currency. Now, you can go to a bank, give them a pile of gold, and, or I don't think you have to, I think you'd have to go to a mint or something, and get money for it, okay? What's Dunn's point? That's what affliction is. Affliction in some people is like a bar of gold. And if they don't turn it into currency, how? The readiness is all. If they don't use that bullion to prepare them for death, then it becomes like what? A bar of gold sitting in the belly. It becomes like that bar of gold, or like that gold that we saw in the wanderer. Though a brother strew his brother's grave with gold, what good will that do the dead guy? Nothing. Okay. So, another man may be sick too and sick to death, and this affliction may lie in his bowels as gold in a mine, and be of no use to him but this bell that tells me of his affliction digs out and applies that gold to me. If by this consideration of another's danger I take mine own into complication, into contemplation, and so secure myself by making my recourse to my God. That is, I take this other person's death and say, essentially, there go I. Turn it into a memento mori. But you remember what that means? Remember death. Reminder of death. A reminder of death. Okay. All right, we'll stop there. For Tuesday, we'll finish it all. It's just all I'll say. We have a quiz on Tuesday? No, you won't have a quiz on Tuesday. Unless you want one, and I can make one. Um, I'll talk about the, the final. <laughs>